conversations with Uli Bear on big ideas and great books. I'm really uh, pleased and excited today to welcome a very special distinguished guest, Paul Mendes Flor. So Paul, first of all, thank you for joining me today on the Think About It podcast. You're more than welcome. <laughs> it's, really, um, it's really wonderful to speak to you. You're in Jerusalem, I'm in New York today. And I just wanna tell our listeners for a moment, so you are a um, widely recognized and acclaimed scholar of modern Jewish history and thought. Uh, you t uh, taught at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and you are the Dorothy Grant McLear Professor of Modern Jewish History at the University of Chicago. And a couple books I thought I should mention to our listeners um, are the, uh, an important biography of Martin Buber called A Life of Faith and Descent. And I'm sure we will refer to that book. But you've also written books on Gustav Landauer, Anarchist and Jew. So we already hear the theme of a kind of tension in the titles of your books, a kind of interesting kind of tension. You've mm -hmm. written a book on German Jews, a dual identity, where you look at German Jews as a possible mirror of modernity. It's sharing two different and distinct identities. Then you've edited other books on dialogue as a transdisciplinary concept. Um, another book on Buber from mysticism to dialogue. And you're the editor of Martin Buber's collected works. And you've been the editor of his letters. And he wrote something like 50,000 letters, which are now in the National Archive in, in Israel. So you've immersed yourself in this tradition, the 20th century tradition of um, major Jewish thinkers. And um, I wanted to start out by actually noting something when I started writing to you recently about this small text, Buber had on Nietzsche, I kept on saying Professor Mendes Floor, and it was very formal. And then you said, oh, we could just say, you could just say Paul. And in some ways I was very touched by that. And it touched, it goes to the heart of what I'm interested in speaking to you about, which is Buber's I am thou of what is a genuine conversation, which is what his interest in the 1920s. Uh, Ein Vau appeared under the title in German, in, well, in December 1922, was, the date is 1923. He was already close to 48 years old at the time. And I, to understand the book, contextualize Buber biographically as also um, in terms of, uh, uh, of the German discourse, or, and more or less, better said, the, the West European discourse, as undoubtedly you're aware of it, um, uh, towards the end of the 19th century, a, a book that was very seminal in this discussion was published under the title Gemeinschaft und Gesellschaft by a, what we would call today a sociologist, over the term yet <laughs> had been coined at that time, a man named Ferdinand Toynis. And it suggested that as we marched into urban civilization, we've lost something very um, fundamental, and that is the, um, human relationships that were bonded by mutual uh, care and understanding, solidarity, uh, traditional communities, which were small and grounded in some sense of fundamental sense of, uh, of community, community in the sense of a shared concerns, shared uh, sense of destiny. Relationships became flawed, um, flawed in the sense that they <coughs> were fragmented, um, guided by an ethos of personal regret uh, and achievement. Um, one that <laughs> necessarily have a relationship to one and one's neighbor. Um, and that established a malaise sense that something's lost in modernity. Uh, and modernity is focused in urban civilization. There was many attempts to recreate within the urban context some sense of community, particularly through nationalism. And that came to a head during the First World War. Um, the Kriegsalemus, the experience of the war, seemed to be a bonding uh, of uh, that is lost and perhaps even return with the march into modernity, bourgeois modernity to be more precise, and uh, and overcoming the malaise of, of, the, of, of the loss of Gemeinschaft, and indeed often referred to, to the, the war experience, which was not only the soldiers, but the, the but but the uh, uh, the society at large, as they uh, gathered under the banner of, of German, of Polish, and whatever, 
often on this saying that God is on their side and God had, <laughs> had was had multiple personalities because he, he, he should, contending communities claim that God was on their side. But um, and Buber himself, like many of his generation, shared in this sense of national identity, both as um, uh, he was actually in Austria, but still he, he was living in Germany and Austria and Germany were allied. Uh, and this sense of, of, uh, of a Kriegsalebnis, a sense of community more warfare, um, and also with Zionism, the Jewish community. Again, now we know what we were looking for, some sense of community. Um, and as the war progressed, Buber was brought to, by particularly his friend Gustav Landau, whom you mentioned before, they realized war is this not a, a, a fantasy. <laughs> it's just not an experience. Uh, people die. People are killed, lacerated, often um, are widowed. Um, and slowly Buber began to reflect on how do we really recreate what was lost in the, as we entered the modern world. Um, and I think that's the, the background of dialogue and the dialogical relationships of which he speaks in I and Thou, my judgment, is is a way of restoring the grammar of relationships that have been lost, um, but not through uh, um, illusionary uh, notions of community such as nationalism. And that is a message he also brought to, to the Jewish community. But Ayn Vau addresses not just the Jewish community, but all of man, all of human beings. In fact, there are only three Jews mentioned in Ayn Vau, and they're Christians, Paul, Jesus, Paul, and Peter. <laughs> And no rabbi whatsoever. <laughs> but let me say something about the book, I know how we, it seeks to recreate a, a, some sense of uh, what we might call Gemeinschaft-like relationships. Uh, philosophically, the background is uh, Immanuel Kant. And perhaps you recall, Immanuel Kant said that only type of knowledge that we really can uh, affirm as, uh, as knowledge is what we gather through our five senses. Um, and uh, go, going beyond empiricism, but gathering information in your five senses, we have a mental capacity to organize um, our five, um, our, well, our sense data in a particular way, particularly through categories of time and space and causality. That's what we talk about when we speak of in science. Uh, and beyond that, we really, according to Kant, we really can't speak uh, in any authoritative way. <clears throat> So what Buber calls in the Lion Vow, we have two ways of entering the world. One way is for what he calls I, it. And the I is, it is the world that Kant speaks of. Uh, and if you read carefully the way he develops that, he speaks about I and it, puts organizes our world according to time and space. And there's a past and there's a present and there's causality. But then he asks the question, is that really what we, uh, what it's really all about in our relationships? And then he introduces the term I thou. Let me say something about I thou. It's lost in translation. Uh, as you know, as a Germanist, uh, uh, do the, the Germans have two words uh, for a personal pronoun, Z, which is very inform informal, and do, which is reserved for the relationships between a parent and a child, between the closest of friends. Uh, and of course, lovers, if you wish to put them in that category. But give you an example how strict the distinction is. Buber was very close to a philosopher named Franz Rosenzweig. They worked together, collaborated um, for over seven years on various projects, including the translation of the Hebrew Bible into German, a new type of uh, trans, uh, translation. They were engaged in a project of renewal of Jewish education and li literacy to a community that was had lost its roots in, in, in Jewish knowledge. They were what we would call uh, the best of friends. I spent some time in Chicago, and of course, there you have instantaneous friendship. <laughs> but they remained for eight years per Z, per Z, this formal. And one day, after eight years, Rosenzweig, in a poem, inadvertently, inadvertently, refers to Buber, the more intimate word, do. And then he apologizes, oh, I didn't mean it. After eight years of friendship. And Buber said, no, this is crucial. Now we are ready. Eight years that we can really, and the Germans even have a verb for it, Dutzen, we can address one another, Purdue. 
And then Rosenzweig re re uh, replies in a poem, uh, I, we are now ready in need, we will address one another, Purdue, but in my heart, I will continue to say Z. Really? Now, <laughs> now, what I understand by that is, and I'll explain that, is to reach a, a, a type of relationship of do, when we address one another in this, in this, this manner, is to create, a, is to achieve a, a level of neutral trust. And here I can give you an example of my, uh, who's, who also a psychiatrist and is existentialist, a man named Carl Jaspers, who perhaps know he was a psychiatrist, but also a founder of what we call modern existentialism. Yes, so um, very, very important in American because he's the teacher of Hannah Arendt. Who, that's true. And a friend, not only. A close friend. A close friend. Uh, he said, all of us, in order to protect ourselves as we engage in human relationships, are like a snail. We have a, a casing, a, a shell that protects us. And it's the way that the titles, the, the way we dress. The way, you know, I have very French, fancy, fancy Belgian glasses. <laughs> I let my hair grow long. <laughs> you know, all unconscious, but it's part of the way. I, you know, it's, the American uh, sociologist, Erin Goffin had a book called The Presentation of Self in the Everyday World. And we all have present ourselves in it. And sometimes we're more guarded than others, uh, other times. Um, and like a snail, a snail, excuse me, will exit the shell when there's no shadow of, of a threat. And so there is he. He, the shell, or she, returns to uh, what the Germans call a panzer, which is also named for a tank. <laughs> Bubert talks about his armor. Uh, but in the shell, we're not really fully ourselves in the, in engaged in the world. Um, and to exit that shell, we need the sense that we're not going to be hurt. That, when, that our vulnerabilities, and we all have vulnerabilities on one level or another, um, will be respected. And that's why it was such a long journey to achieve a relationship that Buber speaks of. Uh, the relationship, though, for Buber is very crucial terms in German. Um, Beziehung. Beziehung has a dynamic the German word is a scene, it's the pull, it's mutual. And so it's not only reaching out to the other uh, in a way of cultivating, nurturing, nurture, uh, uh, distrust. And uh, the word trust I'll come back to is crucial for the story. Um, but it's also a way of us being able to, to present ourselves to the other. So it's a mutual sense of being present to one another. And here's it, the German is crucial. <laughs> Um, the German word for uh, an object, such as this pen that I'm holding, is a Gegenstand, something that's standing over against me. That's the world of it, everything we see. And of course, Buber says, when we relate to other human beings as it, by defining them as German, man, female, elderly, etc., all sorts of categories which we uh, characterize and, and able to recognize other people. Um, but it can be insidious because it can blunt the, the reality of that person. The person is black, and because he, or or there's different class, or professor, or not a professor, or uh, it can be very hurtful. Um, although sometimes we <laughs> we seek to protect ourselves with in the eight categories. Um, so the Gegenstand is something that stands over against us. But the word that Buber wants to talk about is the Gegenwart, which is translated in English as present somebody who waits over against you, waiting to be affirmed, waiting to be recognized, not as an it, not simply as a Jew, Muslim, Palestinian, bald-headed, not bald, but as perhaps you know, whatever, bespeckled, uh, yeah. of certain age, a certain social status. Because uh, we're not only, though, obviously, it's, that's often can be very superficial and even hurtful when those terms are, um, are laced with uh, prejudice, bigotry. Mm -hmm. uh, every one of us is waiting to be re reached out to, uh, and, it's called, and that's called a presence. Uh, and here I think echoes, uh, at least in some sense, poetically at least, if not consciously, uh, the verse in, uh, in Leviticus, you should love your neighbor as you would like your neighbor to love you, or you should reach out to the stranger because you know what it wants to be a stranger. You should love the stranger as you would like the stranger to love you. As already in the biblical uh, commandments in Leviticus, there's a sense of mutuality. We all want to be loved. Right. <laughs> uh, and here's a great difference between Buber and Levinas, but we'll leave that aside. Uh, 
But let me say one thing else about the, <laughs> the translation. In German, uh, one, if one speaks, addresses God, uh, he also, even though God is referred to as the, the Lord of the universe, the King of the universe, uh, you refer to God Purdue. God, according to Buber, ontologically, this is philosophical, but, but also the way we understand, uh, experience uh, the other. God is also the, what he calls the eternal vow. God is always there with, as a source of trust. And therefore, when Buber uh, was consulted about the first English translation, was committed by a, was ex was committed, I guess is the right word in English, it was performed, I guess, with better, better word, <laughs> by a, a Presbyterian Scott, a very gifted uh, man named Reinhold Smith. Uh, Reinhard Smith, of Smith. Um, and they chose the word in translation for do, vow, in order to capture the religious moment. And for Buber, uh, who was in many ways an anarchist and had a very iconoclastic, at least not typical view of religion, our relationship to God is for our fellow human beings. When we say address the other human being as a vow, we're also addressing God. And so Buber had many reservations about um, addressing God through prayers, particularly penitential prayer, a prayer that often obscures our attending a synagogue, a mosque or a, syn or a synagogue, um, obscures the, the real challenge of, of serving God in the marketplace. And that's a metaphor he takes from a, a, Hasidic, a religious community within Judaism called Hasidism. Uh, and that's a... Uh, a 17th century popular movement in Eastern Europe, uh, addressing the poor. Uh, Judaism puts a great emphasis on study, but if, but if, if you have to go out and work, uh, you don't have the option to go study, there are no fellowships available. And the vast majority of the poor members of a community cannot devote themselves fully to, to the sacrament of, of study. And, and study in Judaism is understood as a sacrament. Or you can worship God according to the founder of that movement, in the marketplace, and it's not speaking of uh, uh, what's the American supermarkets, uh, best, best uh, Whole Foods, right? Oh, it's not a Whole Foods, but a marketplace <laughs> or, where people struggle over to get the best bananas or the best tomatoes. Yeah. Uh, and how do you worship God in the marketplace? Or when you go into the woods to collect wood. Uh, and every aspect of life is a challenge in everyday life, Korean life, is where we are begging to serve God. And that includes our fellow human beings in the most difficult situations, the most ordinary situations. And not just our neighbors in a uh, in a residential sense or those who live in a fine, um, I don't know where you live, but <laughs> but we do tend to live in residential, more or less with people with the same background and interests or economic uh, status. Um, the German word is, it comes from Luther, actually person who's next to you at a given moment uh, and it, and that person represents all of humanity um, so we, we reach out to the next person who we're by chance meet uh, in a variety of of, of uh, moments of one's life uh, and not necessarily fellow professors or fellow people bourgeois etc <laughs> uh, uh, well, let me yeah. ask you. Let me ask you a question about the what you said about this idea of presence, which I think in in maybe in American English, we can capture the sense of this. What Buber wants to get to say when we know we are in the presence of another person. Sometimes we feel actually when someone walks into the room or someone stands behind us, we are aware of that. And he wants to reorient. It seems to me in the book when he says we are from the beginning always in relation. There's no such thing as the eye which then ex exposes itself or goes out into the world and encounters things. And the translation is complicated because I think that thou creates a bit of a distance for an English reader. And then the second word of this book is the human being is in the world. And in English, it becomes man immediately, which in some ways is almost too defined because I think where Buber wants to go, and I think why this book resonated so much is said, we are already in relation. And he says these word pairs, I, you, or I, thou, and I, it, they are relations. They're not two words put together. They cannot be taken apart. Right. So I'm interested in when he comes up with this idea that 
we are already in relation. There's no prior state where I'm the subject putting myself out into the world the way you said in Kant, and then we make sense of sensory data or in Descartes, the philosophical subject or the liberated Euro European subject after the enlightenment and all the French and various revolutions and what he lived through World War I, the Russian revolution, this idea of the political subject as autonomous. Right. So, and, and I'm, there's two, two, so there's this idea of the IU relation and the I it relation. And right. I think a lot of people read this book for a long time. And I, and I, I was talking to friends of mine who said, oh, everybody read this book in the 60s. Everybody read this book in the 60s. And there's a second translation by Walter Kaufman in, I think, 72 or something like that. Right. And I think it opened up a possibility, what you said, to reorient ourselves to remember that we are already in relation. It was a kind of, that had been forgotten in this project of modernity where everybody right. is out for himself or herself. All right, indeed. On a philosophical level, as, as Buber's in a school of thought that objects the Cartesian notion of I and, and the objects that we, um, that were, uh, I and thou is of course, as Buber calls it, I and dialogue is between two subjects. Um, and that is fundamental to the human experience. He even says, Somewhere uh, in the book, I'm not, I can give you the page number, but there's an inborn Tao. Uh, inborn is that the child is already in relationship in the womb to uh, his or her mother. Uh, of course, the translation of man in German is Mensch. You know, German has uh, 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 Mensch is human being, and, and there's another word for the gender of man, but he's speaking of the human being, although it's translated in English as man. Uh, so intersubjectivity for philosophy is, is, is the, the, the philosophical grid of Buber's thought that we live in uh, uh, with one, uh, one subject, one eye to the other eye, so to speak. Um, and we recognize the other eye as, as not just you know, an it, to, but as a, a fellow subject in the fullest sense, we uh, address that person as a vow. And that's what vow or you Calvin had difficulty because he wanted to read it, Buber's book as humanistic, purely humanistic, and had difficulty with <laughs> with God in the story. <laughs> so when he comes to eternal value, he uses block letters for the U and to give it. Uh, uh, oh, actually, this is actually quite important. So just say something more about that because I wanted. There's two questions I had, and I read. I tried to read as much as I could about it, and the book has been received a little bit as as if Buber is dismissing the I-it experience in favor of the I-you. Although he says in the book, you cannot live without this it, but to live only with it is not being fully human. He said, we live always constantly in relation to all sorts of things and objects and things we just use, et cetera, et cetera. He said, that is not lesser existence. It's just the way we are in the world. And then the second part you just raised, Kaufman wanted this book to be kind of an existentialist book and ultimately downplays the presence of God in that book in a way. So and he sort of says, you can, you can use this book and read it as a kind of manual for how to be in the world and you don't have to live with God. And I think that is probably misses a fundamental dimension of Buber. Yeah. Philosophically, Buber wants to ground his notion of dialogue in what we call ontology, mm -hmm. the fullness of being. Um, and God is the ground, the concept of God is the ground of being. He says, you recall in the third part of uh, the book of uh, Ion Vell, you don't have to say you believe in God. There are many people who declare they believe in God and not really related. It's not a question of, of, of belief in a sense of confessional uh, statements. Uh, uh, it's the way you organize yourself, your, your, your engagement in the world, and particularly others, but also the world of nature, uh, which constitutes for what would Buber calls spirituality or religiosity. Philosophically speaking, it is um, the concept of God as a source of trust, and I'll come back to that in a moment, um, as, the, as the ultimate ground of an authentic life and allowing us to be authentic to ourselves, like to get out of that shell and to reach out to the other and allow the other to withdraw from that shell. Um, I was just asked to write a little essay on a, a project on phenomenology of love uh, organized by two very gifted uh, Romanian scholars. So they asked me, of course, to contribute an essay on Buber's phenomenology of love. Uh, and he does speak about love, but love not in the, in the Kierkegaardian sense of preferential love. I know, 
no, I'm married almost for well, more than 50 years now to the same woman. <laughs> uh, uh, and obviously we we uh, linked, if you wish, we got, we connected because of some uh, uh, ineffable notion of 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 a uh, of what we call preferential love, erotic love, uh, uh, and even not for the it's not even a question of ag agapeic love, where you're, you you sense that you you have an op, uh, an obligation to be charitable to the other. It is for Buber uh, a way we encounter the other uh, for human beings, and he uses the German word, or well, English can hear in English, love is responsibility for the other, not responsibility in the ethical sense, but responding mm. to the other. The giving a response to the other German Antwort but to the other and his or her um, ultimate self, which we now call the thou or the you, if you wish. Um, and that uh, again is anchored in the notion of trust. What is crucial here for Buber uh, is that the Hebrew word, a biblical word for, for belief, is trust. It's mm -hmm. translated um, uh, as in German for trauen. Uh, yeah. which means trust. God is a source of trust. And, and here it can be theological for a moment, but it gives a sense of Buber. Remember, Buber doesn't say it's a question of confessional belief. Um, and he actually wrote a book on that, two, what he calls two types of faith. Um, and two types of faith is belief that, if you have metaphysical, uh, theological um, commitments or convictions, if you wish, that's not what Buber has in mind. Uh, and the other form of tr uh, faith for Buber is tr trust. And God created the world and behold, it is good. And in fact, very good. But we experience it as awful, <laughs> painful, <laughs> on a personal level and a communal level. Now the world is in the midst of an epidemic. That doesn't suggest that the world is good. <laughs> uh, and a lot of hateful uh, rhetoric and actions that divide human beings on an on intercommunal level, and the personal level, as well as, of course, politically. Mm -hmm. uh, so how can we then bless the world as being good? And that's actually the project of Bobo's friend, Franz Wolzenzweig as well. How do you accept the torments of life and the ultimate torment of life is that we are finite. Uh, we are, uh, and the ultimate signature of our finitude is death. Mm -hmm. Death. <laughs> that sounds like very, that sound very promising, especially when people will die in a, uh, or close to you and you love and care for. Well, I need not expound upon that, but uh, uh, so how do you affirm life with all its uh, fraught realities uh, and still say it's good? And here the, the notion that God is a source of trust to move on, not to, to leap out. Just allow me a, a more, more theological, because it's in the background, but on a, different, yeah. on a philosophical level, or more of a philosophical level of sensibility rather than confessional faith. There was, in, uh, in the early period, uh, well, more or less the centuries of, um, in which Christianity arose uh, and rabbinic Judaism also developed, a series of movements and sensibilities called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is the Greek word for knowledge, you hear the word agnostic, suggested that the world we live in is, is uh, with all its foibles and all, is not, where, is not where our soul was destined to be. We have to just have to escape from this world. Uh, and Gnosticism provides arcane, secret knowledge how to climb out. <laughs> uh, and it generally makes a distinction between body and uh, the flesh and the soul. Um, and that had a great appeal. And I just, well, about two, three years ago, maybe more, I wrote an essay on neo Gnostic attitudes in the, in the Weimar Republic in the wake of the First World War. Uh, a renewed interest in, in Gnosticism on many levels. Uh, and that had political implications that, um, of questioning any possibility of a human a humanistic liberal order it's not going to help mm -hmm. uh, uh and it, well spinning that too far we have carl schmidt and others you know uh, political theology which is really basically a form of gnosticism uh, and buber uh, was interesting he was he, he gathered with several uh christians catholics and uh and, and pro, um, uh, catholics and protestants German they call it catholics and christians to, uh, to stop his journal called the Ucuyatur, to affirm, and Malta Binyamin others participated, uh, which is the last years of the Weimar Republic, this journal, we have to affirm despite everything that we are creatures and that we have to make 
Uh, we have to noble life somehow. That obviously has a political dimension. For Buber, going back to Ayn Vow, is we have to, with all the struggles of human relationships, um, is to ennoble or dignify our relationships for our own sake, not just to be nice and good. And <laughs> in that sense, Buber's Ayn Vow is meta-ethical and meta-political. When you say it in the third part, when you just said, he says, you don't have to believe in God, but it's, he says, you said something right now, but there is a possibility for being in authentic relation or recognizing that we're already in relation to not under, to sort of not forget that in a way. So he says, you don't need a particular conception of God or an avowal of faith to, right. to have this, this, what he considers, I think this book is both normative in a way, this is how you should be, but also just descriptive because he talks about how young children experience the world, how other cultures experience the world. It reads like a book Freud wrote in the 20s. So if he, he takes all these, this, these experiences of human beings. And so it's normative in the sense, this should be our authentic relationship, but it's also just descriptive saying, this is the relationship you're already in. Right. I, I, Hilary Putnam, Putnam wrote this really beautiful little essay on Buber and says, people are embarrassed by this book because no one wants to be told how to be with others. He said, we want description, <laughs> we don't want normative description. You want, we don't want to be told how to be with others. And he said, it's an embarrassing book for philosophers. The way, which is, I studied with Stanley Cavell and, and Hilary Putnam, Putnam says, the way Stanley Cavell's work was embarrassing to most philosophers because there's a kind of normative <laughs> dimension. But so to go back to when, when he says you don't have to believe in God, but God is really vital in this book. Without that awareness or trust, we would not know how to be in relations with others. Right. right. Uh, two comments. Uh, uh, I forgot the one, <laughs> but we just one I do remember. I want to return in a moment. Uh, you know, uh, the term we use is uh, when he opens the, the book. The two forms of of attitudes. Um, one is called Haltung, the, the term in use in German is Haltung, the way you hold yourself, the way you po posture yourself uh, in, 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 uh, in, the, in the world, in re meeting, relating to the world on all its levels, um, particularly of course for our fellow human beings. You could be on God, distant, and you hear that very strongly in a German, Z, keep your distance. The Abstand, you know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just there's a recent book that just well a few ten years ago on, on the social codes of of uh, of Germany uh, and the wake of the first world to maintain distance and not express your emotions because we all terrified we've gone through a tremendous torment so we have a social code of not expressing emotions. I recall having a wonderful conversation with a, a neighbor of Freud's. Here, of course, now in here, Jerusalem, she, she said one point what we we, we Germans lacked is Zatlischkeit, tenderness. We've, we've, I think Americans would say we're uptight, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but we have a social code to keep distance. Uh, and that Boomer is questioning that. Because uh, to keep distance means you, you're not only keeping distance from the other, but you're holding them back from you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and a child, of course, relationships when they are, are with our parents, it is a healthy relationship, is, is tenderness. <laughs> the tenderness is a, is a moment to the child, well, in the womb, if you, we have no way of knowing that, but he calls it. <laughs> but as soon as the child ent 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 uh, enters the world, he, she is embraced, mm -hmm. that warmth. And that's why the child, the do is there, it's a halto. And, I, and have then, to, I have to ask you, as a, a bio the biographer of Buber, you have yeah. to tell the listeners about because you do actually refer to this experience he had in early childhood, which structures his life in a way. And maybe you can tell the listeners what his experience was with his own parents and mother, because you bring it up in the biography and you're very cautious. I actually like the way you say, well, it's, it doesn't overdetermine everything he wrote, but it does play a significant role. Certainly. Um, he was dispositionally not dialogical. <laughs> he was <laughs> terrified about yeah. human beings, as many of us are. <laughs> There's some of us like you, I guess you're very, you're, you're dialogically dispositional. <laughs> yeah, no, I try, I try. <laughs> <laughs> but try. I mean, that's a, he gives, I mean, I listened to his lectures, their lectures on YouTube, which is amazing, this kind of 
beautiful but halting speech. Um, but you said Buber was not a person who just immersed himself in a sort of social okay, situation. Uh, yeah, he also had a speech defect as a child due to a, a, a birth defect. Uh, so he spoke very deliberately. He also uh, was not a native German speaker. And that was the language he uh, mm -hmm. she uh, forged his intellectual life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a, I just mentioned to a friend today that uh, in Jerusalem, <laughs> he was part of the German speaking community of prof exiled professors. And one of us, Gershom Sholom, who was a German, German Jew, uh, in an essay criticizing Buber, opens up with the less <laughs> with the line, Buber was a Polish Jew. <laughs> and it has no, as <laughs> a way he said, he was really not one of us. <laughs> and he felt it. And moreover, uh, it's a significant move. Buber's wife was not Jewish. Uh, she was from a Catholic background. And make things worse, if you wish, to put it that way, uh, putting it worse in, in quotation marks, they had the children out of wedlock. Two children out of wedlock, and but they uh, yeah. they ultimately married, but stayed married until I think she passed away in nineteen fifty. Well, they had a very firm relationship, so uh, almost and, sixty years or something like that. They stayed yeah, together. Yeah. She was a very important collaborator, also in early in the in the. Oh, throughout anything he published, if she was a native German speaker, a, a very gifted writer. He showed her, yeah, and she would correct his <laughs> his German. Of course, he knew German very well, but. Yeah. Uh, there was a concept, in, as you perhaps know, what they call minority uh, German. Kafka spoke new German, really, but he was conscious that he was speaking a language which is not his own. Derrida once said that he only has one language and it's not his own. <laughs> <It's Right. funny. laughs> so it's a sense that you're an outsider, of course. Uh, it's it. interesting that you're saying he sort of had the sense of being an outsider. He's in a world which um, the book you wrote on German Jews, a dual identity, were there are an enormous amount of incredibly gifted, important writers, poets, artists, etc., who are both inside German culture and also right. a little bit outside you. And ultimately, I also think the book is really important because you say we have to look at this not just from the catastrophic endpoint of the Holocaust, but also the beginning of Mendelssohn talking about enlightenment. Right. So this, but when you say oh, Buber wasn't exactly, it wasn't natural to him to go up to people and say, I want to open up, I want to, like with Rosenzweig, it takes him eight years, and even then they're kind of keeping a distance. So why would someone like this, what do you think motivated him to try to propose? And then another book you wrote is A Land of Two Peoples, Buber on Arabs and Jews. So he actually put his philosophy immediately in the context also of politics. He didn't remove himself from the world at all throughout his career. Not at all, no, no, definitely. Uh, there's a, a very interesting word in German, which is not a fully uh, um, amenable to translation. It's called Geborgenheit, which means security, warmth. Uh, it's related etymologically to the word birth. Uh, and I think Buber uh, was searching, kind of, the the urgency of Geborgenheit. He didn't have, a, his mother left him and his father when he was three years old. She dashed off, never said goodbye to him. And that for a child of three, he just couldn't comprehend it. And, he, and to the, end, the very end of his life, when he was 86 years old, he still referred back to that moment. Um, and it's, it's not just the mother, but the, the Geborgenheit that a, a, a wholesome family provides particularly, of course, with the mother. And then he was sent off. The father couldn't handle him. He was three years old. So he went off to his father's uh, uh, parents, who were Orthodox Jews. Uh, and they didn't have, uh, they couldn't exp explain anything to him. They don't know how to deal with it, as is often the case. And they just said, well, you know, put, pray, <laughs> observe. <laughs> and as soon as he uh, left that world, he, he wrote, I, I just wrote a little essay on that today, um, senseless tradition, he called it, at the age of 20, the senseless tradition. It didn't, mm. and it was a tradition that didn't provide him with, as it was experienced, not necessarily the, the tradition, but his experience as a child who was suddenly thrust into, into the care of his grandparents, who perhaps didn't know what to do with him, how to handle him, because uh, he was a, a very uh, unhappy child. You know, he says in his autobiographical uh, fragments, the first experience he had 
of trust was when he would go to his father's stable. His father had a farm and he would pet the horse. Mm. The horse, because the horse responded. And that's mm. often why, you know, a little pets are important. Booba's home household had nine cats. Cats. Wow. Not cats is a delicatessen, but cats. <laughs> that's totally a joke, but it didn't work out. <laughs> but thank you for laughing anyway. <laughs> but animals, pets are often more reliable than human beings. Yeah, I come home, my wife is, uh, has a problems. I have my trust. But when you come home, the cat is always there, ready to. <laughs> right. You know, it's nice. well when when Jacques Derrida taught at NYU, he starts one of his later books on both on hospitality and animals. He says he had a little a little cat that moved into his house, and he said he stepped. This is a very funny anecdote. And Derrida said, "I stepped out of the bathroom, and the cat was looking at me, and I was embarrassed." <laughs> Because the cat gave me a sense of another presence. And he said, it's ridiculous. The cat doesn't know whether I'm dressed or not dressed. But he said, my self-consciousness put me in relation to another being. So he opens up this reflection. And I always was quite moved. And I thought that was very funny, imagining Derrida coming out of the bathroom with a little tiny, it was a little kitten. But I think what you're saying, what Buber is sort of saying, we have these experiences of Geborgenheit, of feeling held in the world, but also he's in a world where this existential homelessness, as Lukács says, where it's a kind of fragmentation and there's no tradition that holds him entirely. Right, right. indeed. In fact, uh, a, a book that followed uh, Ayn Rao, which was, a, uh, the language was expressionistic and he wanted to, I'll come back to that in a moment, to evoke a, a sense of experience. Let me go actually say it now and then I'll tell you about that. Um, towards the end of his life, he was quizzed by various philosophers. How would you, Herr Buber, Herr Professor Buber, characterize your philosophical legacy? Uh, and Buber said, I, I don't really want to, those categories are not going to really help us. All I wanted to do throughout my writing is to, to hold your hand, walk to a window, open the window and point out the window. It's something we all experience, all know. What it means, as you very well put it, to live in a, in a chaotic world, a cosmic world, a world only is bounded by tradition or small society, societal relationships. Uh, so he's talking about a fundamental human experience of being uh, uh, othered, to use a more common term. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But so what did he say? His legacy was to just basically take his reader metaphorically by the hand and say, I will be with you. Right. Not only, no, to point out what experience that we all to acknowledge. Okay. Yeah. And so he tried to, the way he wrote I Am was to evoke that experience. Mm -hmm. uh, subsequent that he wrote another book, uh, which is more uh, 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 expository in a, in a more classical sense, uh, which is now translated between man and man in English, but it, the German term is Schriesbach, and then eventually came the notion of dialogue, or the term dialogue. And of course, dialogue is not what you mean in, in literature. It's uh, it's really this interper interpersonal um, uh, engagement uh, recognition. Again, uh, rooted in a, and grounded, if you wish, in a particular way we posture ourselves to the world. Haltung. Right? So it's not purely, uh, there's other words in German for attitude. It's not a phenomenal attitude that you would find in, as expressed in Husserl and others. It's not an epistemological or cognitive uh, perspective, but the way you are embodied in the world, so to speak. Uh, uh, I really now I'm losing track of what I want to say. Uh, no, okay. Yeah, I want to say something else about. Uh, a vow Buber speaks is speak, say you saying a vow, but you don't have to say vow necessarily in words. In the book I just referred to, he speaks about uh, uh, just meeting another person eye to eye, uh, or even in the passing in, in an elevator. Somehow, I mean, it's not a it's not a, a long engaged relationship, but simply a moment of mutual recognition. Uh, has nothing to do with words. And a story he tells often, uh, but it's an important story. He was a very famed writer before uh, uh, he, at the age of 40, 48, had this, what he referred to as a, uh, a volte face, a turning of, of his position. 
Uh, 48 is, I'm, I'm almost 80, and it's still, but 48 nonetheless is, <laughs> yes. is a big way <laughs> in adulthood. He already had more than 200 publications by the time he was 48 years old, but in a diff very different genre than we're familiar with as when we speak of Buber as a philosopher of dialogue. Uh, and during the First World War, uh, 1916, he was, somebody came tapping at his door at six in the morning, and you just don't do that even in the United States, but certainly not with a German professor <laughs> unannounced at six in the morning. But fortunately, Bubu was already up because he was a vocal heart. He worked very hard. Uh, and he saw this bedraggled soldier. And he said, I've been watching for days from the Austrian front in order to speak to, to, to you. Bubu was about six, six in the morning, but all right, come in. I, I, I can devote to you a half hour, which is very gracious. <laughs> A man coming to your home at six in the morning, uninvited. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can imagine that Booba pulls out his pocket watch, <laughs> leaves on the table, somehow indicate that the time is, is, is essential, half yeah. hour is half hour. And reflecting on that occasion, he said, I was very cordial, man, asked questions. So I duly answered the questions as best as I can. Uh, and after a half hour, I said, I'm sorry. I, for, I, had I had more time, I would have I'd been I'm more than glad to continue our conversation but we would say respectable certainly no circumstances such respectable response to his uninvited early morning guest the following day Buba learned that this guest this bedraggled soldier took his life and then Buba realized that what he failed was not to address the questions the man articulated but the questions inscribed in his forehead hmm. and his body language as I think he would say Mm -hmm. uh, and that means learning how to listen. Dialogue is not simply a way of carrying on a conversation, but learning how to listen. And, and listen, listening appears as the, the superficial, what Buber would call to me, superficial. Uh, you know, he, he plays with the German word. If Fahm was the term that Kant says that the world we gain for our five senses. But for the five senses, we just float over, Fahm, which is a German word, over the the incidentals, the, the ordinary uh, uh, sense that are, uh, which we, uh, we um, inflect with categories, Jew, young man, uninvited guests, guests, etc. Uh, we just, the following is, you know, that's the ordinary world. We just glide over it, but it's superficial. Uh, and learning how to pierce the, those, that matrix of, of of usual recognition. I'll come back to another question you had asked earlier. Uh, is learning how to listen, not to hear, we hear, but not necessarily listen. Uh, and that's the great challenge. Regarding uh, the world, the possibility that Buber's romanticizing dialogue, it was he was challenged by his friend Rosenzweig. Uh, but we do live in the world of it. We, we can't avoid going to the market to buy tomatoes. We can't avoid, uh, uh, preparing our lessons or uh, or uh, uh, learning how to operate a computer or how to organize lives, our lives politically, etc. And so Buber calls it the sublime melancholy of returning to the world of it. We do must return to the world of it after have we pierced the, the armor of the other. Mm -hmm. uh, I give a very, since I'm an Israeli and I... Uh, and I see, I share some of Buba's political, not some, but he spent uh, Buba's political sensibilities. Uh, our life here cannot be at the expense of our neighbors. Uh, and unfortunately, well, I, I don't know, <laughs> I can say it loud and clear, we're, we are, we're abusing the Palestinians daily. Uh, uh, and it's, of course, very easy to see them as anti-Semites opposing our, the usual way we deal with the other. Uh, as adversaries, uh, but the adversarial mode is it maintains itself, perpetuates itself, and, and deepens itself. That's also true, of course. The Palestinians, we are us. They, have a lot of, they obviously see us as adversaries. <laughs> uh, so how do we break that down? I just could go, well, a few months ago, I received. Uh, I can't want to go into names, but a very major political figure uh, in the uh, the presidential um, staff who was engaged in issues of. Well, I don't want to disclose who he is because, yeah, <laughs> but how do we <laughs> develop dialogue with our adversaries? This is a major figure in America. It's quite, 
uh, as opposed to negotiating. Yeah. Uh, in other words, how do you, uh, how do we pierce the army, uh, the armor of, of adversarial relations? Right. Uh, but going back to the Israeli situation, because it's so much, it's, it's more uh, immediate to my, my experiences. How do we, uh, under this, this very difficult situation, develop trust that we we learn that is that Spuber's concern, how this can be a, a land of two peoples, not just one people over of abusing the others by. To, well, I don't want to, you know, I, you, yeah, I'm sorry, you, you're familiar with the story. Right. Uh, uh, that's learning to listen, not just to hear of their complaints and they hear us and we re, we rehearse each other's political lit, lit, litany. Um, but listening has an effect of, uh, as you know, as a teacher, uh, your students come to your office hours. Uh, sometimes it's not just their questions about the material covered, but they have existential questions uh, or uh, and it's not actually what is verbalized. Um, so, so when yeah. you when you responded to this kind of immediate political question, what you're saying, this question is not an I it relation only. This is not just a functional. How do we see their demands and how do we meet our and compromise and negotiate and use all of this? But you're saying something else has to be part of it as well, which is to really see somebody else and to really have what you call in one of your books an unmediated listening without having all these professional ideological intellectual emotional sort of preconceptions so so i think this is why the book was so important in the 60s to people and why people still return to today in america we have the same situation as you know that there's this whole idea of a breakdown of dialogue you cannot talk to the other side there's no way to speak to these people who hold opposing views. So what's your... So what, I just what, to, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to flesh out the idea of a sublime melancholy. Yeah. We, after we've somehow come to a new consciousness, it, if you want to put it this way, that the dialogue that Buba speaks of could take place in a minute. And it's, uh, it's transformative in our consciousness, and that has the phenomenological aspects that I don't want to burden the discussion with uh, uh, technical terms, but uh, but you do return to the world of it. We live in the world of it. Uh, but somehow changing the sensibility of the other, uh, or going back to the language of Avis, no longer as an adversary, but a challenge to how we can learn to live together and respect the one another in, in, in terms of our own histories, our own agonies, our own his stories. And, um, uh, so the, crucial in the book, I and Thou is the end. It's not, I become you, <laughs> but I remain myself. And in fact, by relating to you, I, I, I ennoble myself. I allow myself to emerge from my shell as you emerge from your shell. And that's what you, trust is mutual. Uh, but it is trust what would you say to somebody to say, well, are you expecting me to trust the other, but I cannot rely on the fact that this person will then also reciprocate. They will just betray me or cheat me or... Right. So Buba calls that mismeetings, and more, more often we have mismeetings. You open up to the other and mm -hmm. then rebuffed. Or, uh, and the question of, of course, how you sustain a relationship. Mm -hmm. Franz Rosenzweig uh, shared many of these concerns with Buber, and he said, marriage is not in the marriage contract. It has to be renewed every day. And we have a Hebrew expression that creation is renewed every day. All relationships are renewed and renegotiated. I'm not the same person, uh, same experiences, the same torments, the same, uh, I just read this beautiful book, poetry I told you. Uh, yeah. I'm renewed every day. <laughs> and so is my wife, my children. Oh, this, is, this is quite a, it's actually, it's, it's quite radical to think you renew your relationships every day because that means also you risk the relationship every day because there has to be then two people involved. So I remember I'd said, I studied with Stanley Cavell who wrote these really amazing books on Hollywood um, romances, um, these kind of right. remarriage comedies where two people are already married and then they have a possibility to leave the marriage, no children, lots of money, no problems. And he said, this is when it gets interesting because then you have to make a moral commitment to the other. Right. It could be, it could not happen. So what you're saying, the renewal every day means also you're risking yourself every day. Because- right, well, definitely. Echoing Buber's, uh, so to speak, intellectual uh, curriculum was Nietzsche. 
He read Nietzsche as a young man, as everyone in his generation. Right. Uh, even as a boy of 16, he sought to translate uh, Nietzsche's uh, Let's Make Zarathustra into Polish, which was the language of his education, not German. Well, and I'm, I'm happy to say, because with your help and facilitation and mediation with the Buber estate, my little translation of Buber's essay on Nietzsche is going to come out in the New York Review of Books, which is a very young essay when Buber is so excited about Nietzsche, who is a philosopher who says you have to continually risk yourself in this act of creation. Precisely. That's where I see so you got the point. Yes. Uh, yeah, but you, you kind of emphasize that actually in our correspondence about this yeah. short essay on Nietzsche that that philosophy is creative, not just critical. It doesn't just well, diagnose definitely. the world, right. but it re recreates it. Yeah. Every day is a risk. <laughs> All relationships yeah. are a risk. Right. <laughs> Even this conversation is a risk if I come across clearly, coherently. <laughs> I think, Paul, this is actually, I was thinking about this when you were speaking earlier, how do you really listen? And when before you even brought it up, when my students come to my office hours, I think my obligation is to really see them. And it's not to explain this or that that was unclear in class, but if I recognize and see them, it is such a, an important thing for me to even say who are my students and for them to be seen by me. It's so, not easy. Not easy, especially if you, know, you don't like a student. <laughs> I think, uh, or, <laughs> one of the challenges of being a teacher is Occasionally, your the students are much more intelligent than you. <laughs> many, many times, it happens a lot. <laughs> so there's a risk. <laughs> but actually, I think that's actually nice. You're saying, I mean, also the fact that Buber, what you said, he wrote so much. It is a, it is so daunting. I mean, and the, the, you know the the collected works, and I think there's also that openness that he continually would revisit things or test them out or write essays or respond to political concerns. He has, he responds to things constantly, it seems. He's not removed from the world in some ivory tower no. or seminary. Yeah. No, certainly, yeah. And that was, I think that was a, an ethical commitment as well, uh, to, to be engaged in the world, to listen. Uh, and he, of course, he was very multicultural. He not only was, of course, it was part of the, so to speak, the the matrix, the cultural matrix of Austrian Hungarian Empire that you knew many languages. <laughs> I when somebody told me a joke, it was in a diary of a father, uh, and <laughs> some man introduces his son as knowing all these languages in, in Vienna. And the man says, <laughs> and respond, your son knows all these languages? Does he want to be a waiter? <laughs> <Kill me. laughs> Does he have to do a <laughs> That's fantastic, right? <laughs> I love yeah, that. To be a, uh, the German word is a waiter in, in yeah. Austrian Hungary, you had to know all the languages. But that was Boomer too. He, he, uh, he entered the cognitive universe of many different cultures uh, and added to them. He knew, for instance, Italian. They loved Italian. And it just, he and his wife spent a year in, in Florence and they decided to return when they returned to Germany, they will be speaking Italian at an evening meal. They hired a maid who spoke from the area of, Ger of Italy, the purest German, a uh, purest Italian, never allowed her to learn, learn German, but she, <laughs> so the, the children, all children, they knew, knew it and spoke Italian at home. But say and something it, about, this is, I think, <laughs> interesting, um, about his relation to Hebrew, because I think there was, in your biography, you say there was an uncertainty that he said he never quite mastered Hebrew, and he kept on publishing in German most of his, his, his life, right? Yeah, he knew Hebrew, but spoke in modern Hebrew uh, was, had he had acquired that, and, and uh, he was already in his 60s when he came to Palestine to teach at the Hebrew University, um, and he did have experience speaking modern Hebrew. He knew <laughs> Biblical Hebrew, uh, rabbinic Hebrew, but um, but to speak, so he had actually a tutor. Uh, really, <laughs> at age of sixty, to learn how to speak modern Hebrew, uh, which is of course based on the tradition, but it's uh, nonetheless it's a, a different type of uh, exercise and a different book, different use of vocabulary, etc. Uh, 
So I think the joke was that uh, uh, tell Boom, don't worry about speaking Hebrew because you're gonna have to speak Hebrew in a more limited way. But then we'll finally have an opportunity to understand what you really want to say, <laughs> as opposed <laughs> to convoluted German. <laughs> right. But it is remarkable he translates the Hebrew Bible into German. But then he said, "I don't oh, he knew Hebrew very well, but right. not not spoken modern Hebrew." Right, right, right. <laughs> um, when you when you think about um, I and Thou, which I mean I I understand what Kaufman did because he worked with Buber's son, I think, who was the literary executor of the estate. But I do think the book suffers a little bit from that title alone. And I think for, because I read it now in English and I read it also in German. And in German, it's a poetic book. It's just sort of it's kind of you just read it. It has a lot of ideas. It doesn't. It's not a philosophical treatise that references all these other philosophers. Right. It sort of lives on its own. And I, when you think about that book today, um, where would you situate it? I actually, I was struck that, to be honest with you, I think it should be up there with civilization and its discontents, with maybe being in time, with so with the tractat, with the major works of European thought. But somehow it's sort of in a strange position. Right. Buber uh, experimented with. Uh, uh, there was a book that pre preceded that by 10 years, the Iron Vow called Daniel. Uh, likewise, he sought to have uh, uh, the name Daniel is not referring to the biblical Daniel. <laughs> it's, a, it's quite an extraordinary moment. He got a, an honorary doctorate from the Sorbonne, and he, they mentioned it in the, uh, the document, a very elaborate document uh, in French and Latin. Uh, He's the author of this Jewish book on Daniel. It has nothing to do with it. It's, it's really it was a response to Zarathustra. Daniel was also a, a, a denizen of the of the of, of the Iranian world. Uh, and very, it's very clear that he's what we call Zarathustra Stil in German, the, the, uh, the style of Zarathustra, mm -hmm. uh, which is on the border of what we call expressionism, evoking human experiences, etc. If you're familiar with that, and he tried to do that in, in Ayn's Zau as a poetic, poetic philosophy, uh, in order to evoke a, a sense of a, what we all know or should know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Behind it is a philosophical issue uh, that I. I believe is also there. Um, Schopenhauer, uh, Arthur Schopenhauer, because a contemporary of, well, pre preceded uh, Nietzsche, uh, a bit, uh, contemporary of Hegel, I should say, uh, a man had a lot of sense of despair. He would, uh, he, would, uh, he would schedule his classes the same time that Hegel had his, and Hegel was very famous, and he was one. Hegel has 300 students, I have two. <laughs> and he continued <laughs> to do that. But, but behind it was a sense of uh, human uh, loneliness, and he contributes it to the Kantian world. With uh, I'm certain you're familiar with this. Is that a Kant told us the world is organized, taught us that they acknowledge that the world is organized according to sense data, which then we organize through our mental activities, time and space, which allows us to say, and when the space, this pen is not this, <laughs> I am not you, according to, uh, to Schopenhauer. The distance is one of isolation, and therefore he recommends that we, as you perhaps call, a turn to the Indian wisdom of Nirvana to sort of break off our relationships to this world. Uh, but towards the, uh, through Nietzsche, we there was a revival of our interest in the uh, in Schopenhauer. You know, I'm certain you know it had registered in music and in art in the fondest, in the end of the 19th and 20, early the turn into the 20th century. There was a revival of interest in, in Schopenhauer. Again, okay, this notion that the modern world that we're isolated from one another. Uh, how do we overcome? Buber's friend uh, Randau, you mentioned before, was a part of that discourse, and he said in German, said powerful German, hätte ich keine Augen, had I no eyes, I would not be able to be separated from you. Mm -hmm. I would not be torn into the web of isolation, the world of what we would call I, it, or Kant calls the world of a firewall, and the world that appears to us. Uh, is is there's we're isolated necessarily I, i'm not you and you're not me but we're isolated uh, uh and that's part of the story as well how do we overcome and that's 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 what uh, uh it infuses Buber's relate understanding of the ayat world if you read well if it was a class i would show you how he, he's saying that he talks about this about the ayat world isolated 
He said it's a seri, but isolated, right? It's, it's yes, the, the doing best. it constantly. Yeah. But we, I think what I took from reading the book recently, it's very hopeful and kind of um, daring in a way to say, no, we have this capacity. We have this capacity to actually have, uh, to be in real relation. Um, we probably retreat from it quite a lot because it's easier, it's safer, as you said, we retreat into our shell. And it hurts often. The miss, we, that's a term he coins, mismeaning, for mm -hmm. And that's what he learned about is from his mother. You know? mm -hmm. He reached out to her, mm -hmm. and, little boy, Ma, where are you going? <laughs> Never turned around to say goodbye. Many years later, he, when he introduced her to his his children, he couldn't look at her in the eyes. He couldn't. Mm. He felt betrayed. And, uh, yeah. But it's. Um, it's and, just, yeah, and that concept of mismeaning, and it. <laughs> We often have rebuffed and hurt, but without that risk, and you very well put it, there's a risk in relationships. You go out of your shell and then, yeah, yeah well, or you well, reach out. Paul, I want to say, I sort of, I wrote you this email sort of, you know, we were sort of connected through our friend Amir at Stanford, who I'm really close to. And then my uh, advisor, Jeffrey Hartman, and Renee, they invited you to Yale a long time to give the talks that became that book, German Jews, a dual identity. So. I actually, for me, it's really uh, moving and wonderful to be to be on Zoom with you. Uh, it's really a nice experience. And and then I I just want to also share this with our listeners. I think I read as much as I could. I read, of course, Martin Buber, Life of Faith and Descent, your biography. I read German Jews, A Dual Identity, which is a short book for our readers. So you people can read that actually pretty quickly, right? And then You've also edited dialogue as a transdisciplinary concept, how this could be used. So I, I just want to thank you for opening up an intellectual space that somehow I wasn't quite tuned into as much. I mean, I also listened to a lecture you gave on Heidegger and Buber, which we could have an entire other conversation on, which is just fascinating how Buber managed to respond to Heidegger, who kind of didn't listen to him in a certain way. But I just want to thank you for this um, this opening up this this entire this man's work to the world today it's really it's so critical i think and i i do think i think i and thou should be retranslated with all due respect to walter kaufman and, <laughs> and, the, and the scott <laughs> well, well i want to thank you i very much enjoyed meeting you and <laughs> Uh, meeting you in a dialogical sense. <laughs> in a dialogical uh, sense, exactly. So I, I hope we can continue this conversation. Uber probably would have said and a real life meeting is also important, right? Indeed, indeed. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. So again, I want to thank uh, Professor Paul Mendes Floor. So Paul, it's been a real, a real pleasure and a joy. And I will let you know when we post this episode, which I think will attract a lot of attention in a time when dialogue is urgently needed.